So it's my great pleasure to uh, actually jump in for Katharina Schmidt today, who was going to do the introduction, but sadly cannot make it. Uh, me and Sarah will guide you together with the two ECR um, speakers here, uh, Maren and Christoph will guide you through this webinar. Um, I just have a few introductory words to say. Um, first of all, thanks everyone for coming. Um, Today, we will hear about expectancy mood dynamics in depression from Marta um, Pethinia. Okay, so I did not have Spanish in school, so I will be probably worse at pronouncing uh, your name. But uh, yeah, I'm very happy to introduce Marta Pethinia. Is that okay? More or less. Okay, uh, to you. Um, she went to medical school at the University in Navarra in Spain and finished her MD in 2004 and also completed her PhD in neuroscience in 2009 and also her psychiatry residency training. Uh, then she became a postdoctoral fellow in 2009 and moved to the USA to the University of Michigan, where she stayed until 2016 and also became a research assistant professor. Her work there focused mainly on inter-individual variability in placebo energies and uh, antidepressant placebo effects, and also the interaction between expectancies, learning, and mood. Uh, since 2016, she uh, works in uh, at the University of Pittsburgh and leads the TNN lab, uh, so the Translational Neuropsychopharmacology and Neuroimaging Lab. Um, first, she, she started as an assistant professor and um, became associate professor of psychiatry in 2022. So her main research focus is on the neurobiology and individual differences in mechanisms of treatment response and depression, and also on how expectancies and learning mechanisms impact mood improvement and responses to pharmacological treatments. And she uses placebos as experimental probes. So that's very uh, relevant for our uh, TRR. Uh, her methods include fMRI, PET, physiological measures, behavioral measures, and also computational models. So I'm very happy to have you here, and uh, the stage is yours. Thank you, Mary, and this was um, very nice. Uh, I'm so excited to be here, just because I'm not used to give, talking about um, this topic to an audience that is actually you know, experts in the field. So I'm really happy to be here. I'm looking forward to hearing what you think and what you have to share. And Lena, I also very much enjoy your topic. I think it's a very relevant one. So um, just, just keep up the good work and, and it's very exciting. Let me just share my screen real quick. Here we go. Um, so I'm going to talk about biological mechanisms of expectancy mood interactions. And um, I'm just going to skip my introduction here because um, Marin cover it all. <laughs> so very grateful to be part of these three institutions. They're all amazing in many different ways. So I'm grateful to have been in, in the, the University of Bar, uh, Michigan, and now in Pittsburgh. I think I've learned so much in each of them. Um, and I think as I mentioned, or as we were talking, really the goal of our lab is to examine individual differences in mechanisms of antidepressant treatment response, really to try to look for new targets for therapeutic interventions. Uh, we're interested in understanding how expectancies and learning mechanisms impact mood. And we use placebos as probes. Um, and as Marin mentioned, we use functional MRI, positive dynamism tomography, and in conjunction with physiological and behavioral measures to try to understand how expectancies um, and learning mechanisms shape mood responses. And so um, as um, Lina was also mentioning, you know, depression is a very prevalent disorder. Just in 2020, major depressive disorder affected 21 million adults in the US and 280 million adults worldwide. Uh, and current projections indicate that by 2030, there will be, it will be the leading cause of disease burden globally. Now, depression becomes more persistent with subsequent episodes, with 50% of those recovering from the first episode experiencing a second one, and 80% of those with two or more episodes having recurrences. Um, there's also response to antidepressants happens in approximately 50% of individuals, 
um, with full remission only achieving 30 to 35% using first line antidepressants. And then for those who are non-responsive to two interventions, then remission rates drop, drop significantly to approximately 10 to 25%. So this is not a very optimistic scenario here. Uh, we also know that placebo responses are very prevalent. Uh, I know Lena mentioned a little bit of a higher uh, uh, placebo response rates. And this paper really describes approximately 40% response rates to antidepressants um, to placebo, to placebos compared to 50% response rates to antidepressants. So if you think about it, there's actually minimal difference to who would respond to an antidepressant to, um, as well as the placebo. And so really this high prevalence of placebo responses in depression have significantly contributed to the current psychopharmacology crisis where large pharma companies have reduced at least in half the number of clinical trials devoted to CNS disorder. And this is just from the year 2009 to the year 2014. So it's really not that long ago. And if we think about it, this applies not only to uh, pharmacological interventions, but also to, um, to um, deep brain stimulation, for example. So deep, as you know, deep brain stimulation is a neurosurgical procedure that uses implant, implanted electrodes and el electrical stimulation of the brain. It's actually an FDA approved treatment for Parkinson and OCD, but it has not, we have not been able to, to it's not been approved for depression. And this is one of the you know, this, this paper really shows one of the reasons why it's not been approved. So um, you can see here that patients with resistant depression were assigned to six months of either active or some subcutaneous deep brain stimulation. And that was followed by six months of open level uh, DBS. And then you can see here that there is no significantly significant differences between the two groups compared, um, even though they both improved, but there were no differences between the two groups. So really this is for us to just learn that it's not just because we only give pills, uh, it also happens in the context of surgeries. And so um, there's not a specific, most of what we know, and you are probably well aware of this, most of what we know about the placebo effect comes from the field of placebo analgesia. And even though I probably could skip all of this, I'm just going to cover this very quickly. The classical theories of the placebo effect have consistently argued that placebo effects results from either positive expectancies regarding the potential beneficial effects of a drug, um, as well as classical condition with the pairing of a neutral stimulus, in this case, the placebo appeal with an unconditioned stimulus, in this case, an active drug, and that results in conditional responses, which is the actual placebo effect. There's newer theories. There's also other theories that I'm not going to cover, but there's newer theories that basically posit that it kind of derived from the previous ones that basically posit that individuals update their expectancies as new sensory evidence is accumulated by signaling a mismatch between what is suspected and what is perceived. And this information is then used to refine future expectancies. And I'll talk a little bit about this later on in the talk. And so um, this conceptual model has been elegantly incorporated into trial by trial manipulations of both expectancies of pain relief as well as the pain sensory experience. And this has rapidly advanced our understanding of the neural and molecular mechanisms of placebo analgesia. So in a common neuroimaging study, for example, in placebo analgesia, um, there is always, it tends to be a, a verbal information phase where patients are told that they will receive either a potent analgesic cream, for example, or a cream control. And then uh, when in reality, they are both inner treatments. Then during a conditioning phase, the potent analgesic is paired with a low intensity of stimulus, whereas the control condition is paired with a high intensity of stimulus. And then finally, during the test phase, patients go into the sky and receive the same pain stimulus um, for both groups so that the differences in pain reports rely only in the expectancy manipulation and not the actual pain experience. And so these kind of um, experiments have uh, resulted in meta-analytic studies 
um, that have revealed two di distinct patterns of activations with decreases in brain activity in regions involved in brain processing, such as the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex, the amygdala, the thalamus, um, somatosensory areas, as well as increases in brain activity in regions involved in um, affective appraisal, such as the ventromedial prefrontal cortex or reward processing, such as the ventral strainum and the periarticular brain. Now, from a molecular perspective, uh, there's been a number of uh, studies that have uh, tapped into a number of different molecular mechanisms. Um, I just choose the opiate system because it's possibly the best replicated finding from a molecular perspective. You can see here that um, one of the very first studies um, to examine the, the biology possible effects use naloxone, uh, which is a myopid antagonist to block uh, placebo analgesia. And then there's been a number of additional studies using pharmacology, ph 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 both pharmacology, pharmacological agents, as well as positive enemy tomography. So this is a lot of the work that I did as a postdoc at the University of Michigan, um, looking at changes in myopia receptor availability and how those related to uh, personality traits, genetic variability and others. And so in the field of antidepressant placebo effects is significantly different. Um, one of the difference has to do with the long-term dynamics of moods and antidepressant effects uh, that have really not allowed for that trial by trial manipulation of expectancies that we see in the pain field. So instead, researchers have used broad brain changes at rest in the context of a randomized control trial uh, or even uh, placebo leading phases. And it really hasn't been until more recently that we, we have started to use a trial, a trial by trial manipulation of antidepressant expectancies. And I can, um, I'll tell you a lot more about it in a minute. And so um, because of these, um, it is kind of interesting to realize that um, the very first study, one of the very first studies that looked at uh, placebo, uh, at the neural mechanisms of placebo analgesia was published in the year 2002. And the same was the case for antidepressant placebo effects, but then the field of placebo analgesia progressed so rapidly, whereas the field of antidepressant placebo effects is one very, very slow. And so it really hasn't been until more recently that we have started to use these, um, you know, the newer methods um, that we have been able to, uh, to, to address this question. And so one of the main questions that from the very beginning is if we look at antidepressant placebo effects, are there shared molecular and neural mechanisms to what we already know from the field of placebo and analgesia? And so indeed, uh, we already knew that there's monomenergic neurons in the brain stem that are implicated in mood disorders and that are heavily regulated by opioid receptors on multiple sites. In particular, a major source of mood modulations are gabaergic neurons in the dorsal raphe and the VTA. And so we decided to look at uh, changes in opioid neurotransmission in response to antidepressant placebo treatments. And so we also knew from a different study that there was um, higher baseline measures of myopia receptor availability in the ventral striatum were correlated both with higher depression severity as well as better response to antidepressant treatment uh, during 10 weeks of an SSRI. So this really suggests that the depression severity is linked to both reductions in opioidergic tone as well as mechanisms of treatment response. And so following up on these findings, we um, conducted this study where we recruited 35 individuals with major depression and they were assigned to two identical placebos for one week. Now, half of them were told that they were taking a fast-acting antidepressant, whereas the other half would well, were told that they were receiving a placebo that had no effect. Now, after a week of treatment with these pills, participants completed a scanning session with a PET and an fMRI and then we were switched to the alternative treatment condition and repeated the same scanning session. Now of note, um, the scanning session following the active placebo included also a saline intravenous injection with expectation of fast acting antidepressant effects. So at the end of these two uh, weeks of placebo leading period, then patients enter an open level trial with 10 weeks of an SSRI. 
and it was open label. And so you can see here that uh, the administration of the active placebo compared to the inactive placebo, and that happened over the course of a week, was associated with decreases in depression severity, but also intra the, the response to the intravenous fast-acting antidepressant placebo was also associated with decreases, decreases in depression severity. And so first, what we found is that uh, placebo-induced reductions in depressive symptoms after one week of active placebo compared to inactive was associated with greater opiate release in the subgenual here cingulate, the nucleus accumbens, the mid thalamus, and the amygdala. And um, in addition to that, we also found that the response to 10 weeks of SSRI treatment were associated with greater placebo-induced opiate release in the subgenual and here cingulate, the ventral striatum, the mid thalamus, and the amygdala. And not only that, we also found that placebo-induced endogenous opiate release predicted 41% of the overall variance um, in tr of treatment response by the end of the trial. So just with one molecular mechanism, we could explain at least 41% of the variance at the end of the trial. Now, um, when we examine um, changes in mood between placebo responders and non-responders. We found that placebo responders show significantly better treatment outcome than placebo non-responders. And all of this really suggests that greater placebo-induced opioid release um, predicted the response to one week of, open of placebo as well as eight weeks of open-level antidepressants. And so, as I mentioned earlier, an important aspect of placebo research in, in the antidepressant field is that the delay mechanism of action of common antidepressants and the slow dynamics of mood response that really not allow for an acute manipulation, and in that sense makes the experimental manipulation of placebo and the person placebo effects harder. And so um, we came up with an experimental design that was able to successfully um, uh, modulate expectancies of mood improvement as well as mood responses. And I'll tell you in a minute what this was like. So the way we have done this is um, we basically tell participants that we're testing the effects of a fast-acting antidepressant, which now is credible now that we can use ketamine and others. Um, it just has become a credible story. Um, but in reality, we... Um, we are just giving them salience. So then we tell them that they receive multiple infusions of these drugs intravenously inside of the scanner while we record their brain activity, which we call neurofeedback. Now patients then learn that positive neurofeedback compared to baseline is more likely to cause, to cause mood improvement, but they're not told that the neurofeedback is simulated. And so then they come into the scanner, we place an intravenous line for the injection of this fast acting antidepressant, which in reality is saline, and then we bring them inside of the scanner. So now once they're in the scanner, patients complete um, this antidepressant placebo fMRI task, in which the basic structure of this task involves an expectancy condition where subjects are presented with four second infusion cues followed by an expectancy rating cue. And they're also, that's followed by a reinforcement condition, which consists of 20 seconds of some neurofeedback followed by a mood rating cue. So um, the expectancy and the reinforcement conditions uh, map onto the classical theories of the placebo effects that I had described earlier. So now during the expectancy conditions, the antidepressant infusions are compared to periods of calibration in which we tell them that we're just calibrating the equipment and nothing is being given to them. And then the reinforcement periods, um, there's some neurofeedback that happens 80% of the time and it's positive, and that is compared to baseline neurofeedback another 80% of the time and that's baseline. And so basically what we have is this two by two study design with four different conditions, the antidepressant reinforced, the antidepressant not reinforced, the calibration reinforced, and the calibration not reinforced. And um, an important aspect, and you're probably familiar with this as well, is that we use authorized deception for this research as well as previous research, the one that I saw you um, 
using positive animation tomography. And so basically we tell the participants that we are withholding some information until the end of their participation. We're telling them everything about the risk of the study, but we're not telling them the purpose of the study until the end of their participation. And we also assess their credibility, um, how often the study drug was given to you during the infusion peers. We also ask them how often did the neurofeedback signal reflected your brain activity. And so if participants reply zero to both of these questions, then we exclude them from participation in the study. And so in the very first study testing these, um, this experiment that I mentioned, we, um, we enrolled 25 MDD patients with and without anxiety, and they had moderate levels of depression, but had been antidepressant medication free for at least 21 days. We did um, use other deception here as well. And then participants completed two sessions of this antidepressant placebo fMRI test. One after one hour um, after the administration of naltrexone, one single dose, 50 milligrams, um, an hour prior the fMRI scan or placebo. And this was basically to see whether we could use this manipulation, this pharmaco-fMRI um, investigation to actually examine the effects of the opioid system as well as the neural correlates. And so you can see here the behavioral effects of this test um, and the actual sample ended up being 20 individuals who were unmedicated depressed. And you can see here how the um, Participants reported higher expectancy ratings here on the left after the antidepressant cues compared to the calibrations, and even more so during the positively reinforced um, condition compared to the baseline. And the same thing applies to the mood ratings. So um, individuals reported higher mood ratings during positive neurofeedback, and that was even larger during the antidepressant cues. And we have actually replicated these findings in four different data sets at this point. Um, so these results are actually pretty robust. We can see here that these effects were moderated by depression severity, such that the effect of the task conditions on the expectancies and mood ratings were weaker in more severely um, depressed. So basically less severe depressed individual had greater placebo effect of these uh, task conditions on both mood and expectancy ratings. Now, at a neural level, what we found is that the expectancy um, of antidepressant infusions compared to the calibration was associated with increased bulk responses in visual areas, as well as the dorsal attention network, including its, its extension towards the DLPFC and the BLPFC. And here on the right, you can see that the reinforcement condition, on the other hand, was associated with similar increases in the dorsal attention network and occipital cortex. There was also additional effects in the ventral strain on the you cannot see in this uh, particular slide. Now, when we evaluated the effects of one single dose of naltrexone at a behavioral level, we found that naltrexone significantly decreased the interaction effect of the expectancy and the reinforcement condition on expectancy and mood ratings here. Um, and then at a neural level, on the other hand, we found that naltrexone reduce bulk responses in the right or retrofrontal cortex during the processing of positive reinforcement, but not during expectancies. And so these results are consistent with the idea that the OFC plays a critical role when updating expectancies to guide motivated behavior and hedonic responses. And so these slides comes from an earlier version of the task in which we collected blood samples as well before and after the fMRI sessions. And what we found here is that greater increases in endorphin plasma levels following the experiment uh, was associated with higher expectancy and mood ratings in response to the task conditions, both infusion and reinforcement. And so in addition, we um, wanted to ask ourselves whether um, the opioid system was specifically implicated in placebo responses or was implicated in contextual processing more broadly. So the same individuals actually completed what we call a contextual framing task. And this task, participants are first presented with an emotional salient contextual image which could be either pleasant or unpleasant. And then they're asked to rate ambiguous faces as either positive, neutral, or negative. They're actually asked to rate as either positive or negative, but they're presented as happy, neutral, or fearful. 
And so we can see here that behaviorally, we found significant contextual effects here, such that patients rated ambiguous faces more positively after the contextual pleasant um, cues compared to the unpleasant. And so um, as in the case in, of placebo effects, we also found that the present severity moderated these effects such that those with lower depression severity had greater contextual effects. And then at a neural level, we found a significant effect of context uh, of different balance in regions such as the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, the DLPFC, extended into the lateral OFC. Now, when we look at the effects of naltrexone, we found that naltrexone partially abolished, abolished contextual effects, but these happen only in less severely depressed individuals. Now, the administration of one single dose of naltrexone was associated again with significant decreases in both responses in relevant regions for the task, such as the BMPFC or the lateral OFC. And so these results really point at, um, to the role of opioid neurotransmission in contextual processing broadly beyond its role in uh, placebo effects. And so in summary, just this part of the talk, um, we can say that molecular imaging using carfentanil has been essential to understand the contribution of the opiate system to placebo analgesia, but also to antidepressant placebo effects. Um, beyond its role in the present placebo effects, placebo-induced endogenous opioid release is also associated with the response to over-level, open-level antidepressant responses. And then um, trial by trial manipulation of antidepressant expectancies are in fact possible. And new opioid, um, the new opioid antagonist naltrexin personally abolishes antidepressant placebo effects by reducing OFC encoding of reinforcement. And then finally, naltrexone effects on opioid neurotransmission extend beyond its effects on sensory processing to moderate um, contextual processing prefrontal regions more broadly. And so um, one, uh, this second part of the talk, I'm gonna be talking about um, some of the newer findings that we have that have to do with the fact that this trial by trial manipulation also help us uh, develop computational models of, um, of reinforcement learning in the context of antidepressant placebo effect. This is research that had been done in the field of placebo analgesia recently. And we felt like um, with this, um, with these new experimental approaches, we were actually able to do similar um, examinations. And so we wanted to test whether um, antidepressant placebo effects could indeed be predicted by models of reinforcement learning. And as you know, um, reinforcement learning posits that learning occurs when an experience outcome differs from what is suspected. And so the expected value of the next possible outcome is then updated with a portion of this prediction error. Uh, which is the difference between what is suspected and what is perceived. And so basically in the context of our um, experiment, we basically started by testing a very basic Q learning model. So in this context, learners placebo expectancies are updated every time an antidepressant infusion is presented or calibration and then an outcome, in this case, neurofeedback is observed. And so um, this was our basic model and this was compared to alternative models. So in particular, we tested a bias learning model, for example, to account for the possibility that there would be different learning rates depending on whether participants were updating expectancies for the placebo or the calibration cue or for the positive and baseline um, neurofeedback. We also tested the mood self-reinforcement hypothesis with the idea that the reward would be augmented whenever uh, mood improvement had been experienced. And then uh, we tested an alternative model, which was the combination of both. Basically, individuals um, had differential learning based on cues, but also based on whether or not they had experienced had mood response. And so again, uh, this sample was 60 individuals and we replicated previous behavioral findings. I, we don't need to go over this again. We also replicated uh, very similar um, brain results. Here, the only difference in our expectancy map is we don't see the, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex activation that we saw before. And in this particular case, the map is actually very similar. We also find dorsal tension network as well as ventral estradiol activation. 
Now, when we compare all these different models, what we found is that the placebo bias learning as well as mood ratings, uh, our, our fourth model was significantly better than all of the other models. And so what we did was we extracted expected values and reward prediction error signals from these models and mapped them into our neural responses. And what we found was that learn expected value or expectancy map uh, was uh, encoded or mapped onto brain activity within the salience network, particularly the dorsal attention, the dorsal ACC and the insular cortex, as well as the prediction error map onto the dorsal attention network here, as you can see. And so really what these results showed is that sensory evidence from the infusion and the neurofeedback cues are encoded in the dorsal attention network, whereas learned expectancies are encoded in the salience network and possibly triggering mood changes that are perceived as reward signals. Now, these reward signals then are further reinforced, further reinforced these antidepressant expectancies through the formation of these expectancy mood loop dynamics that are defined by models of reinforcement learning. And so um, one, um, one, some of our current studies um, at this point are really extending these results, first of all, to um, use these, these acute neuroimaging responses to predict uh, treatment response in the context of a randomized control trial. And I'm, I was planning on not talking about these results, although right now I kind of regret it after having seen um, Lina's work. But anyway, um, maybe for another time, uh, we'll skip this section, but basically we're using these neural responses to predict the response. Overall, our initial response um, suggests that plus, uh, individuals on placebo do better than individuals on our SSRI treatments um, over the, cor the course of eight weeks. And we have also have some data that shows that their beliefs about whether they are on placebo or unnecessary are better predictors of treatment outcomes than drug assignment on its own. But what I wanted to show you, we still have um, a few more minutes. It's really um, this idea that we, one of the questions that I felt like it was it was important um, now that we were able to modulate antidepressant placebo effects acutely is to try to see whether we could use um, transcranial magnetic stimulation to modulate BMPFC responses during the presentation of antidepressant cues. And so for that, we are co currently conducting this study um, where we are recruiting 120 individuals with depression and um, we have enrolled approximately 80 at this point and we have analyzed approximately 25. And so um, these individuals undergo three different sessions of fMRI conducting this antidepressant placebo fMRI task follow um, following three sessions of transcranial magnetic stimulation, in particular theta burst stimulation. And so we give them three different sessions, uh, one with continuous TBS, which uh, if you're familiar with TBS inhibits brain activity. Uh, we also use intermittent TBS, which stimulates brain activity or some TBS, which um, is supposed to um, have no effect. And so just to give you a little bit of a summary of what the protocol looks like, uh, participants receive two blocks of TBS, and then during the first block only, a simulation intensity is gradually escalated in 5% increases in order to enhance ter tolerability because to um, stimulation of prefrontal areas can actually be painful. Now, during the second session, the stimulation is maintained constant at 80% of the moderate threshold. And so we use uh, a modified version of continuous TBS, which consists of three stimuli applied at intervals of 30, 33 seconds with bursts repeated at 167 milliseconds intervals for a total of 600 stimuli. And each block lasts for um, 33 seconds continuously. Now the intermittent TBS session consists of three um, of bars of three stimuli applied at intervals of 20 seconds with bars repeated every 200 seconds for again, a total of 600 stimuli. Now for the sham TBS session, um, 
50% of the subjects are assigned to a SAM TBS that simulates the ITBS pattern versus 50% to a SAM TBS that simulates the CTBS pattern. And so our target of stimulation was really to, um, that is, is within the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex, aiming to target the ventromedial areas, um, just to see whether stimulating the BMPFC could enhance um, but the value representation of the treatment cue. And so um, we had uh, selected this area based on our initial fMRI results within that area, which corresponds to 30% of the distance from nations to inion forward to the vertex and 5% to the left. And that corresponds to an EEG coordinate of F1. If you look at Neurosynth, the connectivity map at that level, it really maps onto the uh, DMN. And then um, you can see here representation of the E-field map to see what the coverage uh, of the stimulation is like. And so what we have found um, so far in this um, small sample is that um, uh, a reinforcement by TBS interaction, which basically suggests that uh, ITBS is associated with increased effect of positive reinforcement and mood responses compared to CTBS with sham TBS being in between the two. Now, at a neural level, we actually found that ITBS compared to CTBS is significantly associated with greater ball responses during expectancy processing, and that increases in ball responses in the BMPFC are associated with a greater effect of the task condition on mood ratings. So basically, what we saw here is that we can acutely manipulate placebo responses, both experimentally inside of the scanner, but also with transcranial magnetic stimulation. And these effects expand beyond the actual task uh, when we look at resting state functional connectivity, such that ITBS compared to CTBS is associated with higher connectivity between our area of stimulation in the DMPFC and the BMPFC. And so just in summary, to kind of wrap up all of these findings, antiopressal placebo effects are explained by models of reinforcement learning and map onto the dorsal attention network and salience networks. Now, neural responses to placebo predict differential response, responses to antiopressant and placebo effects in the context of an RTC, but I haven't shown you those results. Um, reinforcement learning models potentially um, can predict expectancies that are encoded in the salience network, which might trigger mood changes that are perceived as reward signals. And then these reward signals further reinforce antidepressant expectancies through the formation of expectancy loop dynamics. And this is a little bit more of my uh, current work these days. Um, ITBS modulate, um, apply over the DMPFC, enhances placebo-induced mood and neural responses, suggests that we can actually modulate placebo-related networks to induce mood improvement. And so this is pretty much it, um, right at um, 11.45, so we can have some time for questions. This is everybody who has contributed in some way or another to this work uh, from all different institutions that I've been in. And so um, this is it. Thank you so much for your attention.